I think Islam hates us. They have done nothing except wreak havoc and terror for our faith and our religion. We, when we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad. Foundations of society are fragile. We must be the shepherds of our own civilization. If anyone answers either yes or no without making necessary distinctions, both are not telling the truth. They're lying. Father, we pray that your word will become a hammer that breaks rocks into pieces. That you will raise up in this nation pulpits and prophets that will call the nation back to repentance. Will you distance yourself from those who think differently or will you join us at the table and talk about what is really important? This is the Maida Initiative. Conversation without compromise. The first Muslim I met was from was a woman, it was not met, but the first one I had a significant conversation with was a woman from Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And she just wouldn't shake people's hands. Yeah. So I know there's a lot of people, but typically people I meet from the Arab world, the, the uh, huggy and shake hands. Yeah. And generally, looser. It depends the on the culture, depends on the person, also the age. Like when people get older, they get more religious because they're like, yeah, I'm going to die soon. I should probably get around to this kind of thing. Um, because my mom doesn't shake hands, but like, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. But I'm also American. Like, I'm super American. My mom's not. So it's completely different. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. So I never quite know. You, you, you can never quite know how somebody's going to react to things. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people, some, sometimes you'll go to shake someone's hand. Like, oh, no, I don't do that. Yeah. And other times they'll be like, no, 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 come on, bring it in for a hug. It's like, yeah. okay. Completely <laughs> different like spectrum yeah it's i love the spectrum i love knowing that there's people in different parts of it um i'm not very fond of the extreme side but people live their life i can't tell them how to live their life what, what would you define as the extreme side what would i define as extreme um obviously hating people thinking that for me one thing that really irks me is when people think that they're right and no one else is right and i'm the only person who has the right opinion um, I hate that. Actually, there was a time where I was, I'm still in therapy now, but there was a therapy that I went through. It's called DBT, which is called dialectical, I think, behavioral thinking. And the word dialectical basically means that like, it's like nothing, no, there's no one right thing, which is what I kind of like to live my life by is like, there's no right one right thing there are several right things and i'm just living by the thing that sounds the most right to me but that doesn't mean that i can disrespect people who do things that are less right to me so people who think that they're only right and no one else is right those are the type of people that are extreme to me so, so the way i would think about it i do believe in absolute truth mm -hmm. i believe there is a right and a wrong but that's different from thinking i know every single thing about what's right mm -hmm. I do believe in a right, but it doesn't mean that I know every single thing about the right. And mm -hmm. the problem is, I think the pro the main problem with extremism, or n not just extremism, people in general, is that when they conflate their specific narrow view of things mm -hmm. with the absolute truth. Mm -hmm. It's not believing there is absolute truth. It's that I understand it completely and I get to be the enforcement of this mm -hmm. on every one and everything, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you're not God kind of thing. And that's really hard to tell people when they actually believe that. And they're like, oh, no, I'm not God. I'm not this. And then obviously in Islam, like God is forgiving. God is merciful. God is all these good things. But people love to forget that part. They love to remember that he's the enforcer, that he, you know, like is the knower of all things. And that's really frustrating because that makes people think that like that makes people afraid of doing of doing something wrong so they over do some things like I do I have that with my family like I know some people that are like I'm gonna do so many extra things so that if I do something wrong it'll be okay kind of thing I don't know how to explain it or like they'll be like oh like I'm gonna make sure that you pray all your prayers on time you pray your sunnah this is and this and then you know you have to fast these days even though these days are not like these days are not necessary but like for me like if something is sunnah people will be like oh you're not doing that i'm like it's sunnah i don't have to do it but like they make me feel bad that i'm not doing it kind of thing so it's just 
I think there's a I think there's a couple of things to that. I think basically people act like a relationship with God and sin and good deeds are like credit card debt mm -hmm. that some people will try and pay it off every month. Other people will just ignore it for 20 years and they're like, oh, okay, I've got to pay it off in some huge way. Yeah. <clears throat> so they make it transactional mm -hmm. rather than relational. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is when you're doing that, because if, if it's transactional, then what happens is most people have somebody they think is better than them who they look up to. Mm -hmm. And to make them feel better, they have someone who they think is worse than them. Yeah, human nature, basically. Yeah. So, okay, I may not be as good as X, but at least I'm not... As bad as that person. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that's the root of gossip. It's mm -hmm. that we got to feel better about ourselves so we deflect onto other people who we think we're better than. Yeah. Also, there's just such a, like, a, that stems from such a lack of empathy, too, for, like, other people and their situations. Like, we only see one side of people, and then when we see that side, we think they're, like, all other person. And also, like, the thing with things being transactional is this problem with that is that it's just so much easier. Like, if something's, like, plus this, minus this, is so much easier than recognizing that there's complexity to things. And people hate complex stuff. So they're like, well, that's too complicated. I'm just going to do this. But, like, life is complicated. Religion is complicated. Everything is complicated. But people just want to simplify it. And that also is a root of extremism, is wanting things to be easy when they're not ever and nothing is like a straight down slope nothing is a straight up nothing ever stays like borderline it's always going up and down and people don't want to believe that or recognize it yes i think there's there's, there's a huge propensity to want to take complicated things simplify them and find one leader who's going to solve everything for you and and stop taking responsibility for yourself and i i think that's the way we drift Mm -hmm. as people and i think that's a drift we're supposed to fight against because i think mm -hmm. god wants us to be dialed in thoughtful making adult decisions about the world mm -hmm. not simply this category good this category bad i think there's good and bad but the world is generally messy mm -hmm. and it's 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 not a, it's not a simple thing to navigate it's not black and white it's not supposed to be mm -hmm. yeah i think that's also something that i see in like cancel culture I don't know if you know about cancel culture, yeah. but it's basically like someone does one bad thing or there's something in their past that they did and that cancels everything good that they ever did. Um, and also like the opposite. They did one good thing and suddenly they're like the most holy person in the world. And that's annoying to me. I see it on social media a lot. Like also when it comes to like presidential candidates, like people over exaggerate the good that Obama did for example, and then they totally ignore the fact that he deported the most people ever <laughs> in the history of the United States. So it's just like a, yeah, a lot of people aren't able to dig that deep. Yeah, or bomb the most countries. Yeah, exactly. People don't recognize that. Or they do, and they reckon, don't recognize the good that he did either. Yeah. Um, but that's also what comes with being the president of the United States, like one of the most powerful countries in the world is having to do bad shit yeah yeah and you just have to accept that at one point even though you don't want to but you have to yeah it's we've we've lost all sense of nuance in our day and age mm -hmm. and I, I i think that's partly because america has become a, li a less religious culture yeah so, so i think people in in our souls we have this sense of battle between good and evil mm -hmm. and if we don't have a religious sense of that then we just superimpose that onto our politics mm. and we so we think okay donald trump is satan candidate x is the messiah or yeah. the other way around if you want to switch the parties mm -hmm. so you have and i'm always i'm always skeptical of people who can only see the good in their own side mm -hmm. and the bad in the other side mm -hmm. and not be able to have nuanced views of because there are people who say when Donald Trump met with Kim Jong-un, mm -hmm. people, if Obama had done that, would have praised that. Mm -hmm. And who would have criticized that. Mm -hmm. And some of those people have completely flipped now. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. That if because Trump's doing, oh yeah, he's he's trying to make peace and have a good conversation. If Obama was doing, like, no, he's compromised, and the same is true in the other direction. And it is just disingenuous mm-hmm. that you're you, you're just married to your side, mm-hmm. and you're unable to criticize your own side. Yeah. And you're unable to celebrate the good things about the other side. And mm-hmm. it. That does not progress the conversation because yeah. you just you're not really sincere about it at that point. You're just you're backing your side no matter what they do, and you're against the other side no matter what they do. Mm-hmm. That's why people. That's literally simplifying everything. It's like I'm only gonna agree with everything that I do, and if I believed in something in the past, if someone again the Messiah, aka Donald Trump for the Republicans, did this thing, then suddenly it's holy and great and hadith yeah <laughs> yeah like he brought a hadith literally like it's it's ridiculous and people i think that definitely also comes from like a lack of education and like poverty and all these things because people are not taught to cri- think critically like we're not taught in elementary school middle school high school to think critically like there are like lessons with like critical thinking da, 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 but we're not really thinking critically and we're not taught to do that even in college like, I've met a lot of college students that are just straight up stupid. Like, I'm not going to lie. And I'm pretty smart. So I recognize peop- dumb people from <laughs> far away. But, like, it's just, it's sad. And people, like, it's weird. I don't know. That's why I never join political groups or I never self-identify as a Democrat or a liberal or whatever it is. Because I would not, it's not that I... It's not that I can't accept that people do bad things in parties. It's like, why would I want to associate myself with that? Even if they do good things, even if anything. But if there's some sort of corruption in there, why would I want to associate myself? Even the word progressive, like, I am i don't like to attach myself to labels just because I don't want to answer to that. Even though I don't have to. Like, I know I don't speak for all whatever's. But, like, I just don't want to answer to that. I don't want to associate myself. I'd rather be my own person without a limit, without a label or anything. That's just me. Yeah. I think a lot of the, a lot of the labels are, are very, very clumsy. Mm-hmm. And, I, I, and, and to be fair, I think there are people who hold the labels, who do make some, who are consistent with it. Mm-hmm. So I think there's plenty of people on the Democrat side who would criticize things in their own party. And there's plenty of people who are Republicans who would actually crit- critique things they don't like about Trump. And I'm, I'm grateful for those people. Mm-hmm. I'm grateful for anyone who's willing to maintain some sort of consistent standard and actually apply that through all of life, even when it's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's something I respect, no matter what perspective it's coming through. Mm-hmm. I think I, I respect that too. And I appreciate that as well. But it's like when you get more power, more people want you to do more things. And then you have to listen to more people. And it's like, then you have to let some people down. And then the whole idea of Democrat and Republican becomes subjective. Because it's like, and that's the whole idea of political parties. People want them to be objective. But nothing is objective ever in this world for the most part. But like when it comes to political theory and all of that, it's not. It's usually subjective. Everyone has their own idea of what a Democrat is. Everyone has their own idea of what a Republican is. And that's why, again, I don't want to associate myself with a label because I don't even know what Democrat means at this point because a lot of things are happening that, you know, there's also different, like a spectrum of Democrats. You know, there's like establishment Democrats, there's the progressives, you know, like Ohan Omar and all of that. And then there's like Joe Biden, you yeah. know. So there's just, it's all too confusing. So that's also partially why I don't limit myself. And I think that this, basically what we get lost in is we have this national theater Mm -hmm. between our guy and their guy. And we're watching them fight Mm -hmm. and we're just ignoring everything that's going on around us. Mm -hmm. So I I think if we spend half the resources, time, energy, and thought power on who's the president as we do about say local issues i think we'd get a lot more done as a country i think we'd be a happier place as a country yeah because probably you know if, if we're trying to encompass a whole nation's worth of problems 
by one person, we're going to get nowhere. It's inevitable. Mm -hmm. But if we think about, okay, the greater Northgate area, I think we could probably accomplish a lot here. Mm -hmm. I think there's lots of, we could bring together people of different cultures and backgrounds and ideologies and legitimately make our neighborhood a better place. Because there's things that, if we talk about, say, national issues, then there's all sorts of things we disagree about that are actually irrelevant to the way we live our lives for the most part. Whereas if we talk Northgate issues, we could come from probably radically different perspectives and want some pretty similar things in the neighborhood we live in. Yeah, like the street on First Avenue that's up and down and killing my tires. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Literally killing my tires. It's horrible. But yeah, I mean, local politics have so much merit and potential. And I can, I probably have a lot more in common with my neighbors than I do with someone in Oklahoma. Yeah. Like, not like that's just a random state. I'm not choosing it because it's a red state. But I'm saying, like, I probably have a lot more in common when it comes to my city and talking about I 5 and dealing with traffic there and the express lanes or like talking about schools. Like, everyone knows North Seattle College here, but no one knows it outside of, like, let's say in Spokane. You know, like, I'd rather put my energy into that. And admittedly, I don't. And you're right, it is definitely theatrics. Like, people love the drama, everything. Like, honestly, politics is basically a show. It's kind of like People magazine, but, like, for politics. The entertainment wing of the military-industrial complex. Yeah, literally, it's entertainment. And that's what sucks, is that it's not meant to be entertainment. It's meant to be a way for citizens to engage in their government. As active citizens, doesn't have to be as politicians. They can go, you know like campaign and do whatever and help out like clean up the streets whatever it is vote but people don't do that and it kind of sucks and that's why we have organizations that try to encourage that but i don't see them a lot no but but it is this drift we're talking about mm -hmm. within human nature that we want to drift away from personal responsibility and drift towards Somebody else fix this for me. Mm -hmm. And I'll donate money. You do all the theatrics. You do everything. And I'll go home feel good about myself without really having invested in the world around me or the people in my life. Super PACs. Yeah, literally just investing in. And also when they invest in things that they think will help everyone else, it's mostly to help them. Like a lot of, com like we know this, like a lot of oil companies invest in different candidates because they'll say what they want them to say and that super sucks because the people who don't have the money and that need other things to happen it doesn't ever end up happening because they don't have the money to motivate a candidate but that's not why the candidates are running but that's what ends up happening well and, uh, and again this is a there's a problem with having the it so nationalized is that Oil is very relevant to, say, Texas elections, mm -hmm. but doesn't necessarily shouldn't necessarily have a super big influence on on, on national elections. So we just kind of like leave the Texans alone to be their own little country, <laughs> which has <laughs> been happening for a very long time. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> when I whenever I meet and people meet, I meet people from Texas here, and they say, "Oh, what was it like moving from a different?" They ask me, "What is it like moving from a different country?" I'm like, "I didn't move from a different country. You did." <laughs> <laughs> When I went to Texas, it was so weird. People were staring at me, like, because I had a hijab on. I'm like, you ain't never seen someone with a hijab on before? Come on. It was not even just, like, it wasn't even, like, just white people. It was, like, non. It was people of color. I was like, really? Come on. And it was just, it felt unsafe. Like, I really wanted to get out of there. So Texas is not a place for me. But Texas is a weird place. It's a very weird place. Now, what, what I will say in, in defense of, of Texas is that I think there's a lot of people in Seattle, it would be generally more polite towards Muslims, mm -hmm. but not necessarily significantly friendlier. Mm -hmm. because, because I think in, in the red states, people wear their concerns on their sleeves, mm -hmm. which makes it harder to live in to a certain extent. But if people are actually people actually voice their concerns then it's easier to move past them. Mm -hmm. 
So do, running Almeida, what I found is that there's a lot of pe- there's two types of people who don't want to deal with Muslim neighbors. Mm-hmm. There's one the people who are out there in their thinking who. Yeah, so I, I had a guy donate once to me, and I'm a five one c three, so we get we get donations to help the work we do. But one guy literally handed me cash under the table. I'm like, I can't take cash under the table for a donation. You got to give it. You got to write a check or something. It's like, no, I don't want those people knowing where I live. So conspiracy theorists, basically. Yeah, conspiracy theorists. And you have so, and then I had one friend who was super into the most. The right wingiest of right wingiest Muslims are coming to take over the country conspiracy Fantastic. theories, but he was able to voice all that, mm-hmm. have conversations about it. So when a guy from Bangladesh came to wanted to rent his room, the guy took him in. He gave him a place to live, helped him find a car, gave him some advice on proposing to the woman he wanted to marry, <laughs> and became friends with him. Mm-hmm. And was able to develop a better nuance of his views through that. That's that's great. So I think if people are able to voice their concerns, even if they're kind of ridiculous, mm-hmm. and let's be clear, some of some of the the rhetoric, rhetoric around the Muslim community is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It, the, it, but if people are able to voice that without facing too much judgment, with people who are able to talk through their concerns, then you're actually able to move past that. Mm-hmm. The the other there's another side of people who don't voice their concerns and say what they think they're supposed to say, mm-hmm. but have lots of unanswered questions. They're just kind of pushing down, mm-hmm. and they just distance themselves from people altogether. Mm-hmm. So those are the kind of people that wave that oh yeah we're tolerant, <clears throat> like with the signs in front of their doors, with, with, with the signs in front of their doors, but. If you actually invite, if you actually met somebody, they wouldn't know what to say. They'd be, they'd be terrified. Mm-hmm. I've encountered people like that before. Th- there's these two, there's these, there's two sides. They're dangerous, they're terrorists. They're coming here to take over the country. And oh, dinner Friday night, yeah, bring them all over. Yeah. And then there's the other side, which is like, oh, they're peaceful, they're tolerant, they're they're nice, they're great. It's great to have them here. And you invite them to our house. Are you crazy? Yeah. And neither of those sides are. Great, productive, really. And so, so you've you've got to you've got to build an environment mm. where people are able to meet other people and actually say what they think. Because mm-hmm. if they don't say what they think, they'll never move. They'll never move past it. Past it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's all about processing and like a line of communication that's open and like able to again like empathy. A lot of people they would be comfortable listening to someone say, well, you shouldn't be here, you know? Um, And honestly, I would be pretty annoyed too if someone told me you shouldn't be here, but I'm also one of those people who's like, okay, tell me how you really feel. Like, what's going on? Why do you think this way? Because for me, again, I recognize that people are taught this. They're not born thinking this way. They're hearing this from the tv they're hearing it from their families they're hearing it at school maybe they're not hearing it but they're seeing it in textbooks you know textbooks saying stories wrong to students and kids kids thinking that the trail of tears was a choice um stuff like that and i recognize that people just don't understand like they just don't get it and honestly i don't get a lot of things either and i would love for someone to explain things that i don't get and not tell me that I sound like an idiot asshole. Like, I think that line of communication is so important, but a lot of the times you're putting yourself at risk too. Like as a person who is of that minority or of that group, it's definitely like hard when you have to put yourself at risk. Um, And there have to be some people that are willing to do it. And that whole like relation, the story about, you know, the guy from Bangladesh and the super right wing guy. I think that's super awesome. And there's stories like that out there everywhere. And I wish there was more. Um, but we don't hear them very often. Or if we do, they're like romanticized. Yes. <laughs> A lot. So and I think the this is what I what I what I what I love about getting to do what I do is that I, I think the the thing with politics is that 
we 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 want to romanticize solutions to things mm -hmm. when when really making the world a better place is actually quite a mundane exercise mm -hmm. that it's not especially glamorous you don't feel like a hero no it's it's just but these interpersonal things are that's really the key to changing the culture is is people mm -hmm. and it happens in ways you don't see it happens behind closed doors it happens over food just doing the things people normally do mm -hmm. And you don't, very rarely do you fix the world by getting the right king mm -hmm. and then saying, oh, you write a law and that will fix everything. Yeah, exactly. And the whole romanticizing thing too, I noticed that a lot when Bernie Sanders um, decided to run for president the last time and this time, like him blowing up on social media and people like making memes out of him and like joking about how he's like, you know, so cute and whatever. And I'm like, that's not the point of this it's not um but also going back to like just doing things that people do and it's not that revolutionary it is a little revolutionary in that like there's a person from a completely different side of the world communicating with someone else and it's okay and there's no discrimination but it's also like the point isn't that it stays revolutionary the point is that it becomes mundane too like, the point is that it becomes something that no one even bats an eye at because that's what's supposed to happen. That's how it should be. Like, people should be talking. People should be getting paid the same as someone else. Like, I remember I was looking at, um, there's this, I was on Instagram and there's this one company, this new jewelry company that opened up. Um, it's queer owned, trans owned, and it's like a family business. And, um, the owner put up like their their um, payroll like they posted a screenshot of their payroll and how they don't get paid more than their other employees they actually get paid the same amount as their highest paid employee which i thought was pretty awesome and like super radical because that never happens you know people don't recognize that their employees are probably working more than they are and there are ceos that are billionaires millionaires getting so much money and then there are people like cleaning their bathrooms for like one millionth of the amount that they get paid for even though they're putting way more work in um so going back to that that shouldn't be radical i feel like that should be standard practice for people a to recognize how much the work their other employees are putting in and then like equating that with the amount of money they should be making especially since that company is also based in new york so it's super expensive to live there so that's 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 a great segue to talk about religion and say social justice mm -hmm. so so what, what you're describing there is something that everyone getting paid the same amount of money is not something i would subscribe to no it's very communist socialist <laughs> yeah yeah very like super left i'm i consider myself that's the only li like that's the only label i'll take super left that because that's just literally what i am people don't even know what to do with me but anyways sorry continue <laughs> well i the i had one guy on the show who called himself a leftist muslim anarcho-communist oh wow that's out there yeah that's out there that i yeah i would get along with that person but that's that's a lot yeah, it's it's a very interesting interesting mix of things. I'm I'm interested how those sort of fit together for you. Mm. So when we talk about social justice in that capacity, I guess I guess my kind of biggest question is where are those ideas of justice coming from in okay. you? Um, let's see. I'm gonna sneeze. Hold on. Go ahead. <laughs> I can edit out a sneeze. I don't think I'm going to see. Okay, it went away. Sorry, we shouldn't have talked about it. It's okay. It went away. It's fine. Um, but I think one of them definitely comes from being Muslim. Just because Islamically, like, we're taught that no one is better than anyone else. We're taught that we should be... Um, one thing that really stood out to me growing up was that you should stand with those who are oppressed. Um, and that also, for me, came out in how I grew up. Because I grew up in Northgate. Um, I went to a school in Greenwood, and that was a pretty diverse school. And everyone there was pretty, like, the students that I hung out with at least were pretty woke. So we were talking about not saying the N-word. We were talking about 
you know, Islamophobia. We were talking about anti-blackness. I was actually, I have a friend. She used to be my best friend. She was the president of BSU um, at our high school. So growing up, I was always around these people that were super interested in social justice and were super connected to it. Um, and I was always, I always had an understanding that I wanted to do something with social justice in my life. I wanted to do something that bettered my community and helped people be more open and more accepting of others. Um, and so I never really knew how to do that till I got to UW-Bothell. Then when I took, because I majored in community psychology, um, that was my first major. That was the major that I got accepted into when I got there. That was the major that really put everything into perspective for me. Um, and also the fact that the program came out of um, the School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences. Um, the idea of interdisciplinarianism was really interesting to me too. Um, so that's kind of where I grew up, like an Islamic, cool, like everyone's love everyone, blah, blah, blah. And then I was able to operationalize it in university. So, so going back to the, so you talked about Islam believing everyone is equal, no one's better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. What's where specifically does that does that come from? I mean, the prophet. Um, there was like, there's that one quote: "No one, no black person is better than a white person. No white person is better than a black person. Non-Arab, that kind of situation." Yeah. Now, so so yes, that part of it. So, so I, I was reading that quote and everything around it recently, and th there is some there is a way that I think people go wrong with it, because the last verse is except in taqwa, piety, mm -hmm. yeah, and good action, yeah. So I think that I think people jump on that mm -hmm. as a bit of a loophole for it, yeah. That I pray more times a day than I'm better than you, yeah. Kind of situation, yeah. So at times in Islamic history, you've had very segregated class system with pious Muslims, okay Muslims, the the people of the book, and then the polytheists at the, at mm -hmm. the bottom. And other times it's not been like that. And I, I think that that piety thing has a lot of a large loophole for it for people. So if you're say a Saudi who wants to marry a Somali man. Mm -hmm. then you could kind of quote, okay, well, it says that no one's better than anyone else. A black has no superiority over a white, except in piety. It's like, ah, but uh, we are more pious than they are. It's like, mm -hmm. well, no, look at this guy over here. He's drunk. He's throwing up. And, and they say, oh, okay, of course, the least pious Saudi is, of course, not as pious as the most pious Somali. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, we're generally more pious. And people use that, this very arbitrary sense of, okay, who's more pious than other people? Is, is the way to judge people and they only use it in that situation so if there were if say i was saudi trying to marry a saudi they wouldn't use that they wouldn't use the acceptance taqwa, even though that's also part of it you know like okay we're the same completely forget that part what about this part and they would completely ignore that part because it doesn't apply to them um and yeah they would just ignore it just because it's not benefiting them in that moment and I have a problem with that too. That's just annoying. So, so for you, when you talk about how justice should operate in a society, is that is that primarily? Do you think that you have a sort of internal sense of justice which you're superimposing onto religion, or do you think religion is driving that sense of justice, or is it a bit of both for you? I think it's definitely always going to be a little bit of both. Um, personally, I don't consider myself to be it's extremely knowledgeable in islam just because <clears throat> i went to school here um if i were to go to middle school or to school in the middle east um that would be a part of my studies but i only went to a weekend school so no, like i didn't learn nearly as much as everyone else did if i'm a little hungry sorry i didn't learn nearly as much as like my other friends that came from iraq and from syria and jordan like i don't know nearly as much as them um, so I wouldn't say that it all comes from Islam, but I think a lot of it comes from my understanding of it, if that makes sense. Because for me, a lot of people are like, well, you know, Islam is not only like accepting, but it's also like you have to discipline yourself. 
for me personally, I put a lot more emphasis on it being accepting and God being merciful and all these things. And people tell me that I'm like naive for it, but it's whatever. Um, but then a lot of it also comes from the environments that I've grown up in and then the education that I decided to pursue. So I don't think a lot of it's Islam. I think it's also the culture. Yeah. Because a lot of it is my culture. Not like my culture as an Arab, but like my culture as an Arab American or mostly as an American. An Arab Seattleite. That too. Yeah. I was going to say that it's a lot of it is about being in Seattle. As we well. don't live in America. <laughs> Yeah, we, we like to we like to pretend that we don't, but <laughs> unfortunately we do. But a lot of it again is being in Seattle too. Seattle puts Seattle has a huge impact on people. Like just being here, the culture, you know, like Cap Hill. We know what happens on Cap Hill. You know, we love Cap Hill. We love the Space Needle. We love the air that we breathe. We love the fact that we're getting trains and light rails. Um, we have a very specific like. We have a thing. I don't know how to explain it. We just have a thing. There's a thing. Like, Seattle's a thing. Being yes. Here. Yeah. There's America. Then there's the West Coast, which mm-hmm. is different. And there's Seattle, which is even more its own mm-hmm. thing. We're kind of like a huge exaggeration of West Coast. Besides, like, the beaches. Part, we don't have a lot of those. We're not California. But California, Oregon, and Washington are all very completely different places from each other, even though we get lumped into together. But I was just in California, like, two weeks ago completely different from here oregon i was there a few weeks ago completely different not completely different but it's pretty different it's kind of like oregon is kind of like i feel like it's really it's a little bit seattle but it's also a little bit republican i don't know how to explain it which one it's it's really white (laughs) like yes yes. it's not seattle is not that white just because we have like Seattle's population, like historically, was Asian, and then there's a lot of Somalis. Not very many Arabs, but historically, it's very Asian and Somali, and like, because our third most spoken language in Washington is Vietnamese. So, Portland is a lot more white. Yes, we're right here. I think <laughs> we're. That's what it is. I think we're the second whitest major city after Portland. Yeah, probably. Is that where you were, Portland? Yeah, I was in Portland. My brother lives in Beaverton. So. Okay. Yeah, Portland is, it's almost, I almost think it's like Seattle would, would have been like 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's what I was trying to get at. I've, I just get old timey vibes because um, I never really went to downtown very often just because my brother lives a little bit farther and he has a family. So like, you know, like people who are in downtown are generally like younger or like people who work there. Um, so you don't usually take kids down there. But I went with a friend and it was, yeah, brick walls, brick buildings, all that kind of situation, which we don't have a lot left to hear anymore. Have you seen Portlandia? I haven't. No, I watched a few episodes of it. I did. It was, it was kind of like a, I feel like it was a lot more, because they're skits. Yeah. They're all skits. But it was like a, it reminded me of Parks and Rec. A little bit. Yeah, it did. Obviously, the humor, because I'm really into that type of humor. Um, I watched this show recently. It's called Borderline. Um, It's supposed to be set in the UK, and it's like this made-up airport. There's only two seasons, and there's six seasons, six episodes each, which is not a lot. Um, But it's that kind of humor, too. It was really funny. That sounds good, but is it on Netflix? Yeah, it is. Okay. I think it's a Netflix special. I'm not sure. It's really good. You should watch it. I will. But it's only 12 episodes. That's that's the thing with British comedies. All of them are like that. Yeah. They, it kind of makes them, it can make them better, but also, there's also limited amounts of them. Yeah. Even in, even in The Office, there's, in in England, the original Office has 12 episodes. Total, I think. Are you sure? Yeah. Really? I thought it was like. I thought there was a lot of episodes, considering how many episodes of the American one there are. No, so basically, all the first season of the American Office is basically the first two seasons of the British Office, rewritten from American TV. Okay. And that's why it's not that great. Okay. The American Office is good once it becomes its own show, and they start writing new episodes. Once you get past season one and a little bit of season two, it becomes its own animal, and it's much better as a result of that. Mm. Not better than the British one, but... When it's not trying to copy it. Yeah. It's better. Yeah. Things are always better when you don't copy things. Because then you're like, 
trying too hard to imitate it and make it good but it's weird but yeah now we're talking about the office <laughs> yeah that's fine that's the point of this show the the th- this is this is how all my conversations are they they fluctuate wildly between pop culture and deep life topics yeah i mean that's learning my life it's fine that's good <laughs> now so talking about how how um you know, social justice and religious religion interact with you. What what do you do? You ever think about what God's perspective on like the world we live in is, like presidential elections, things going on in our society. What do you think he thinks about that? I don't like to go too far into it, just because, kind of like the fear of thinking or saying something wrong i don't know even if it's in my own head yeah like i just the fear of that but this is kind of the whole idea is that this is what god willed kind of thing but at the end of the day people get to choose what they want i chose to come here it was written for me but i chose to come here and i could have not but i did you know um and people choose to be corrupt people choose to do good things at the end of the day, even if it's written. And I think personally, I think the world is shit. Like I think the the current state of the world is horrible. And uh, some, one thing that I hear a lot is like someone said, it's unethical to bring a child into this world because of how bad it is. And I was like, damn, that's fucked up, but I'm still gonna do it. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it is, it is pretty shit. Like this world is pretty shit. And I don't know how, I don't know. I don't know even what to say to that. It just, this world sucks. And God knew it would suck. And it's just a matter of us doing whatever we can do and whatever is possible and whatever is within our reach to make it better. And that's really all that matters for me personally. Because like, it's not on me to fix someone else's mistakes, but it is on me to try to make things better for everyone else around me and for myself. Because... Um, one thing of, that's part of community psychology is that a lot of people, everyone is affected by everything in their life, not just like the personal parts, like personal relationships, but also laws, um, poverty. They're affected by the stuff that they teach and the stuff that they learn. Um, and that's one thing that really connected me to community psychology is because I personally am definitely affected by the laws when the exec when he signed that executive order for the Muslim ban like that freaked me the hell out because like I'm a citizen but that doesn't mean that they're not gonna stop me just because they don't think I am or because like let's say I flew to like my best friend his mom flew to Iraq and she was in Iraq at that time she was really sick she was trying to get out and it was super hard and horrifying like she has a green card and there's nothing that says that she can't travel over there but she couldn't get back until you know they got a lawyer and everything and then they rescinded the the executive order and so even as a citizen like that shit freaks me out and that definitely affects my mental health so yeah yeah it, I, I mean I, that's completely understandable because it just seems arbitrary the, the 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 banning Iranians travel seemed just non sequitur in a lot of ways, because yeah, how do you meet Iranians in Seattle? None of them are religious extremists. None of them are religious. No, no, no. Sorry. And if they are, it's like every honestly, all the Iranians I meet here are either atheists or Christians. Yeah, and they have um, they sell you know alcohol at their restaurants and stuff. They're not. I don't, it's not even that, it's not even about people though when it comes to Donald Trump. It's just about this is an age old like conflict between America and Iran, and I should just do something to appease my followers. You know, I I don't know if I use that word right. Or I should do something to please my followers. And even if it's outrageous and stupid and dumb, like I'm gonna do it because it makes people go wild it makes the crowd go wild going back to theatrics yeah the it, 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 i think that sort of move is a appeasement of a certain base which isn't thinking which is just has this 
black and white idea of what Iran is as a country. Mm-hmm. Because even if you even if you think the Iranian regime sh- shouldn't be there, one we have to deal with our culpability in making that happen because we have plenty. But, but also, I think you got to realize that Iran, as a, as a culture, is even if you're against the ideas being mm-hmm. promulgated by the regime, which I think is reasonable to be, most Iranians are too, mm-hmm. and. It's not being productive to what's much more productive is to make friends with Iranians, to welcome Iranians, to help them keep their culture alive in exile from a government that kicked them out Mm -hmm. rather than keeping people out. I think they're actually we're actually missing an opportunity to make a better world by interacting with Iranians rather than just banning them. That's why you hear a lot of immigrants saying this country sucks. I want to go home. Like, this is nothing like back home. This is nothing like, you know, and we make, we shy immigrants away from wanting to um, associate with America, wanting to be here. Because there are a lot of immigrants that are like, yeah, I love America. Fuck my country. Like, I didn't get to do this shit when I was over there. But then there are also people who are like, I don't get to indulge in my culture like I did over there. Um, That's why you see hookah lounges. That's why you see like cafes that imitate <clears throat> like the culture back home but because we don't because a lot of americans don't take the initiative and try to indulge in that other person's culture as well um it makes people not want to be here and it makes people not feel welcomed or accepted and again it's the laws but we can if we generate a culture of acceptance then the laws will change but we don't do that yeah. Now, I think it's also important to give some credit where credit's due as well. Because mm-hmm. I, I really, because I, what blew me away is that America actually takes 20% of the world's immigrants, mm-hmm. which is crazy. That's amazing. I met, and I met a Palestinian woman on the flight, my flight back from Turkey, sat next to her the whole time, her two kids. And she, her grandfather, Immigrated to Saudi Arabia mm-hmm. after the 1948. Yeah. Her father was born in Saudi Arabia. She was born in Saudi Arabia. And they weren't citizens there. Yeah, no, you can't. My mom was born in Kuwait. She doesn't have Kuwaiti citizenship. Yeah, she's in America for five years. Mm-hmm. Applies for asylum. Mm-hmm. Becomes a citizen immediately. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a lot of there's there's a lot of work to be done for sure, but also I I love that we're able to take as many people as we do, but I don't think we're and I but I think the attitudes or lack of communication stop us from really embracing the opportunity as much as we should mm-hmm. that comes with as many immigrants as we have. We're taught to fear immigrants though. We're taught to fear that they're going to take our jobs. We're taught to fear that they're going to blow us up. I know that's like super extreme, but that's literally what people are afraid of. That's what people are afraid of when I get on a plane. Like, I see people looking at me. I know you're looking at me. I know what you're thinking, but I'm afraid of my own shadow. Just a heads up. Like, we had turbulence when we were coming back from Dallas. I literally had a panic attack. So I'm like, do you think that I'm going to crash this plane? You're psychotic. But we're just... We're, because we're taught to fear these people, we don't engage them and we don't talk to them a lot of times. But there are like organizations like your organization, for example, that encourage this cross-cultural, cross-religious communication. Um, and a lot of it, when you're like afraid of something, you also shy away from it and you don't know a lot about it. So it makes you even more afraid. And it's just fueled. Like you said, people push down these questions and they just... So talking about going back to the thing about being people saying it's unethical to bring children into the world I've obviously have four the, um, but what do you generally what do you think is going to happen to the world do you see everything getting worse and worse until finally the end of the world or what, what, do, you, what do you think about the future some people I mean I feel like it'll get worse and worse and then we're going to be doing damage control So I think, like, for example, climate change, like, what is it, 2040, that they say that we're going to end up dying and whatever is going to happen. 
Um, I think by 2038, they're going to try to do something. But I don't think that they're going to do anything anytime soon because people are still, companies are still benefiting from making single use plastics. I mean, a lot of people are switching over to compostable things, but I feel like eventually a lot of compostable things is going to be a problem because a lot of anything is going to be a problem, no matter what. Um, People are still going to be buying clothes for like $60,000 for no reason, literally. I actually saw like a video of this Kuwaiti girl talking about, oh, my shirt costs more than your whole living room. I was like, girl, why? Why do you need a shirt that costs that much money? You know? There's going to be people using money endlessly for no reason. They're just going to be spending, spending on things that they don't need. Like we're living this, um, this excessive lifestyle and no one is going to learn to stop until we create a culture that teaches us to stop. And that's probably going to come with the next few generations. It's not this generation. I know for damn sure I could go to Forever 21 right now and buy like 20 things and not feel bad about Mm -hmm. it just because like. I am a part of this excessive culture. And so I always think about climate change and I always think about how greed is fueling it. And this is something that I always think about because I'm so afraid. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. I really don't. So I think things are going to get worse until two, three years before they're supposed to get horrible and blow up. It's going to get better. So my, my position on it is I, I don't deny climate change. But I'm much more worried about people mm-hmm. than I am about climate. That so let's let's say the biggest the biggest the biggest countries that are causing emissions right now mm-hmm. would be India and China. Mm-hmm. Now, if we get to 2038 and people are saying we need to turn this around now, anything we do is necessary. Does that mean, could that justify invading India and China and building an empire? Probably could. And, and, and that's, that's what I'm nervous of, mm-hmm. is that people have a tendency to use crises. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those. One of those problems <laughs> to try and centralize power. Mm-hmm. And that's something I'm, I'm always nervous about. I'm... So as a, as a Christian, I believe in being a good steward of, of the earth. Mm-hmm. I also believe in multiplying offspring to have dominion over the earth as well. Mm-hmm. So I think a, a lot of the people who would believe in radical climate change solutions would come at this from a very different worldview that I had come from, that... If you believe that human beings are an accident on Earth, that we're just some anomaly, Mm. that we're just some mutant byproduct of nature, that somehow by accident is building planes and cars Mm -hmm. and cities, and true humans are supposed to live in caves and forage. That's why extremism is so dangerous. Yeah. So, 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 but I think that's a lot of the, I, the people believing that humans are a curse on the planet. Mm-hmm. They're going to come to different conclusions than I'm going to come to about what the solutions are. Mm-hmm. So, one thing people don't talk about is that, is that even in Seattle, do you know what Bezos is doing with his fortune? Who knows what he's doing with his fortune? <laughs> he's liquidating about a billion dollars a year. Mm-hmm. Do you know what into? Um, Blue Origin, which is his rocket company. Oh yeah, well, no, I thought that was I thought that was Elon Musk. That's SpaceX. Okay. So they're both doing it. Okay. Do you know what Bezos' goal is in putting all that money into space exploration? To run away from everyone. Hmm? To run away from everyone <laughs> when the world goes to shit. No, his uh, maybe maybe he just got a personal capsule. His goal is to move all heavy production off Earth. So instead of polluting Earth, you just produce things. And you pollute another planet. Yeah, but, but it's already dead, right? So if, uh, if you pollute Pluto, nothing dies. Man is a mess. Okay, sorry. Yeah, and that's fair. <laughs> and, and I'm not, you know, I, I don't want to commend or insult Bezos. 
But I like the idea mm-hmm. of moving. You can't pollute space. That's the beautiful thing about it. It's just this dead vacuum where nothing lives. Mm-hmm. So you can move heavy production off the earth into space. I'm, I'm all for that. That's a, I think that's a good idea. But I believe in the, the more innovative people we can produce who can think of good solutions, that's, I think that's good. Mm-hmm. But it, it comes to the way I view history. So I view human beings as essentially corrupt. Mm-hmm. And the world has been increasingly corrupt. Mm-hmm. But I do believe that, the, that Jesus himself changes things. Mm-hmm. So all throughout... My stomach keeps doing things. So my, my take on it is all throughout the prophets, there's this acknowledgement that the world is full of death and suffering. And that's bad, mm-hmm. that we're supposed to pay attention to those things, that we're not supposed to ignore the poor. We're not supposed to oppress people. We're not supposed to take other people's stuff. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's all really important. Nevertheless, this is the cycle of, of human history. Mm-hmm. But there is there is a promise that somebody is going to turn that around mm-hmm. and that person is the Messiah. Mm-hmm. And so Jesus comes claiming to be that Messiah. And the idea of the Messiah's kingdom in, in the prophets was that it was going to break apart all the kingdoms of the earth, mm-hmm. but bless all the tribes and all the nations, that it breaks down man's power and steadily increases the, the, the state of the world in, into a way that's better. Because personally, while there's a lot of awful stuff going on, I think I'd rather live now than any other time in history. Mm-hmm. So if you look at what's happened in our lives from when we were born, like 1998. So we're both born in the 90s. No, we're, I'm almost born in the 90s. <laughs> but we both grew up, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. And we've seen the world just, oh my word, it's... There's a, there's a lot of ways it's gotten worse. Right? Yeah. We both were born before 9-11 and seen everything that's happened to, to the world since then and the world fall apart in a lot of ways. So it can seem depressing. Mm-hmm. But if you take history in 500-year chunks, you go from 0 AD to 500 AD, it gets slightly better. You take the world from 500 AD to 1000 AD, slightly better you go from a thousand to 1500 and you're going down and then up right Mm -hmm. right at the end of that and then from 1500 to 2000 you're going up 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 horribly 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 down down, yeah and then up again Mm -hmm. but generally the the trend is actually generally upward so now the even even then 20 years ago there's far less people and far fewer people in the world in abject poverty mm-hmm. than there were 20 years ago the starvation is less of a problem than it was so poverty is somewhat relative and there's still a lot of it but the abject i'm going to die because i'm not getting any food poverty it is actually decreasing so there's things to celebrate as well as things to as well as things to be concerned about and as a Christian, I believe Jesus is king of the world, is doing good in the world. And, and the danger is coasting. That we just, that. meaning that we just sort of assume the world around us, assume everything's going fine, mm-hmm. and just go on to the autopilot and not think about things. Mm-hmm. And I don't, the world does, I don't think the world gets better by people just switching off and acting like everything's great. I think the world gets better by people taking an active look at the world around them, trying to figure out what God wants for the world Mm -hmm. and striving towards that. And sometimes it's very difficult, Mm -hmm. but that's the only, I think that's the only way things get better. Otherwise things will just leave things as as they are. And if you leave things as they are, they just inevitably decay. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's what's hard with living in this world is people are constantly working. People are constantly Um, running around doing other things that have nothing to do with making the world better and for me like that's my issue that's kind of where I 
that's where I struggle is because where is the line between doing things that are better for the world and also sustaining yourself and doing better for yourself? Because if we think about it, that's what those in power meant to do. They meant for us to constantly be slaving and working and forget about what's happening to everyone else around us and not do anything to change it. Um, so that's why I have a little bit of sympathy, but I'm also like, where's the line? I always struggle with that. Where's the line? Where, Where is um, the line between do something and it's okay, you don't have to do anything right now, you're tired kind of situation. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of where I stand with that. Here's how I think the Bible would answer that question. So, and this is how I, this is how I process it personally, that I believe that God loves you mm-hmm. as an individual. Mm-hmm. And, and I believe that God has shown me his love through the cross, that he's prepared to lay down, to shed his own blood so that I can be his. Mm-hmm. That's how much he loves me. So much that he's willing to die for me. Mm-hmm. And, and rescue me, that he's willing to throw out all my sin, everything bad about me, love me despite all my flaws, unconditionally, unconditionally and help me grow into the person he wants me to be. Mm-hmm. So it's not that I just ignore everything bad about me, but it's that I don't worry about having to deal with that one day on Judgment Day. I believe it's already dealt with on, on the cross. Okay. So as a, as a result of that, I, I'm no longer trying to earn anything. I'm not trying to earn my place in heaven. But I believe God wants to do things on earth. And that I, I don't, it's not that I have to do a bunch of stuff. It's that I get to be part of what God wants me to do. So is it kind of like um, all of that burden is gone now I'm able to do it without the intention of just wanting to get to heaven kind of situation? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I get that. Very very much so. So I believe God has a plan for the earth. And he needs me for none of it. Mm-hmm. But I might get to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. And if you approach it that way, if you approach that, okay, I get, I get to be part of this, then you can enjoy what you're able to do. And you get to sleep at night as well. Because you realize this is this is all in God's hands. Now, there's a way you can say it's in God's hands in a way that's fatalistic. That's like, oh, I'm not going to do anything because... A lot of people do that. A lot of Muslims do that. Um, I've had so many people tell me, just just let God take care of it. I'm like, what does that mean? Like, I, I don't know what that means. Like, does that mean that I just sit here and wait until God does something? Or like, what is that? What Like, do I just live my life and wait for something to happen? No, you got to work for what you want. Um and a lot of people don't recognize that. So, yes, it, yeah, absolutely. So you do have to participate in the world, mm-hmm. but it's not according to the Bible. It's not so that you prove yourself or prove anything to God, or that you have to, or that you're saving up for Judgment Day kind of thing. It's because you're invited to be part of this adventure of what God would would let you be a part of. That you get to be a part of it. So you're accepted. Mm-hmm. You're loved, no matter if you succeed or fail. Mm-hmm. But what could you get to be a part of if you trust God and see what he wants for the world? And that's and that's what I want to see. I want to see what could happen if I trust God and get to work in the world. Amazing right. things could happen and amazing things have happened. And that's the kind of stuff I, I get to be a part of. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't have any illusions of, oh, I'm the one who's changing things. It's not... The, the God could have a monkey do my job mm-hmm. if if he wanted to. He can do anything. He doesn't need me. This is just something I get to be a part of. Yeah. When I was moving houses, my my son was three at the time, and two of my friends were carrying this big couch together. And my son comes along and he puts his hands on it, <laughs> being like, "Yeah, I'm helping. You get you get to be a part of this. <laughs> <laughs> we we don't need you here, but I'm." But I'm glad it's it's actually really fun to have him there with me, and that's the way I think God sees us. That he he doesn't need us, but he loves us and wants us to participate in the work that he's doing in the world. Mm-hmm. But also, because what what the cross teaches me is that 
I'm also so messed up that blood was required to fix me. Mm -hmm. Which means that I do not get to approach the world think a lot of people approach the world thinking, okay, look at they look in the mirror in the morning and think, I'm what's right with the world. Mm -hmm. What's what's wrong with the world is out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Actually, what Jesus says is before you remove the speck of dust from your brother's eye, first remove the plank from your own eye. Mm -hmm. So before so I try and I've I've got to, I've got to deal with my own issues first before I deal with my wife's issues or my kids' issues or my church's issues or my culture's issues or the world's issues. Mm -hmm. And and it kind of starts from there, that you deal with yourself first, those around you second, those who think the same way as you third, and then and then down the line you get to other people. Mm -hmm. Whereas he, the, the the natural thing to do is go the reverse. Go to everyone else. Everyone else. Deal with yourself. Okay. The problem is Iran and Saudi Arabia, <laughs> the Democrats, yeah. the the my my extended family, my my immediate family, and then I'm the victim. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm the I'm the good one. Yeah. Everyone else is crazy. Exactly. But you don't you don't get to do that. There's a sober realization that you no, know, I'm I'm messed up. I don't deserve to live in to have the good things I have. Mm -hmm. But God loves me anyway. Mm -hmm. He gives me his son. He gives me all these good gifts. And now I get to go out and participate in the world guilt-free, but also realizing the importance of interacting with the world. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's really hard about sometimes being a Muslim is that we have to think, am I doing this for the sake of God? What does that mean? Am I doing this to get into heaven? Because I know a lot of people... Um, and they do good things, but you never know what someone's intention is. And it's really hard when you do something and you don't know what your intention is, or you think, or maybe you realize that your intention is, I want to do this so I can get into heaven, which is not a good intention. Personally, that's what I think. Um, and it's really hard to get out of that state of mind because we are constantly bombarded with there's a heaven and a hell, and you're trying your best to get into heaven, just like from an Islamic standpoint. So for me personally, like one thing that I'm guilty of is I don't think about my intention. Um, I think that's both a good and a bad thing because if I think about my intention, I get super confused because I'm like, am I doing this for the right reasons? Am I doing this to get into heaven? Am I doing this because this person will benefit and it's good for them? Or am I doing this just to feel good about myself? And that's really hard to figure out you know, when you're doing something, it's really hard to understand what your intention is, you know, because we do things so fast. Yeah. Like in a split second, we'll make a decision and we're primed to think a certain way. So when we really go in and try to figure out why are we doing this, we have to think about how we were primed and who primed us and why we were primed that way. Um, sorry. And that's why I don't think about my intention. Um, and I think that's I think it's great that. In Christianity, you kind of don't have to think about that. And that's kind of just like gone. Um, and I think it's a lot. It's pretty complicated when it comes to Islam. Well, I think the, the thing the thing that's just worth, worth thinking about is that Islam and Christianity, we're not talking about different things, ultimately. We're all, it's not like Islam and Hinduism. Mm-hmm. That they're a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. That they're like, oh, we have this whole, we have the Bhagavad Gita and all this history that's, this that doesn't have any claims about all of humanity. Right. Whereas the, the with Islam and Christianity, we're all claiming Ab Adam, Noah, Abraham, the prophets, Jesus. And, and so th this is why it matters figuring out what is God actually like, mm -hmm. right? What does God actually want from us? Is there a design that he wants you to be following? following? Mm -hmm. it, is, is it designed for him to be current, you constantly unable to get past your own motivations, terrified of the scales of judgment? Mm -hmm. Is there a reason for that? Or is, is that not actually what God's like? Mm -hmm. And that's and that's what we all have to think about because it, it kind of everything depends on that. Mm -hmm. it's hard to figure out what god is like because there's so many different texts and so many things to follow 
Um, I think what's nice with Islam is that we have the 99 names of God. So there's 99 ways to understand what God is like, um, whether he's like the all knowing or he's the all hearing or he's the the most passionate and the most merciful stuff like that. I think that's what really helps guide people. For me personally, the way that I live my life is recognizing those names and then also recognizing what the prophet was like and remembering or remembering the stories that I heard growing up about the prophet and striving to be like that. Just because for me, the way that I view the prophet is one of the smartest, most just, um, passionate, loving, caring people that have ever walked this earth. And I want to be that. Like, I want to be that person that everyone can trust with anything. I want to be that person that knows how to treat people correctly and want that for themselves um, and to understand what they deserve for themselves too. And to be, because I think one thing about the prophet too is I feel like he put out so much and I'm not sure how much he got back, but I know that he put out so much and I want to be the person who puts out so much. And I live my life by that. Um, so I think that also ties into my whole philosophy on social justice is I put out so much and I recognize people's circumstances and I understand where they come from and the stuff that affects them. And I put that into account when it comes to a disagreement with them or when it comes to them having a bad day or something like that. A lot of people don't do that. Most people don't do that. Actually, I'm probably the only person, one of the Mm. only people who does that, that I know. So yeah yeah it's, it's, it's difficult to do mm-hmm. moment of silence moment of silence <laughs> <laughs> moment of silence how long has it been it's been like what an hour yeah okay um so cu- curious for you are you talking about your description of of muhammad and his life what where does that come from for you is that is that is that come from like a specific book or does it come from just this what you've absorbed from the community as a whole yeah it's what i've been taking in from the people around me and it's been since the day i was born until even up to now um i know a lot of people that lived back home and they studied back home so they bring back all those stories and tell me about them um and it's also like just the text that i've grown up reading a lot of it was about like loving your neighbor, treating people with respect. Um, another thing is like, don't treat yourself with disrespect kind of thing. Take care of yourself, recognize what you need, um, both medically, emotionally, mentally, um, educationally, just taking care of what you need for yourself and then using that energy and putting it out to other people. Um, when I was, I finished most of the stuff that they gave me at Islamic school when I was around 12. And then I used to help them out with tutoring the younger kids. Um, and then when we were working there, tutoring and like helping the prof- the teachers as well, um, on in the mornings, on Saturday and Sunday mornings, we would have something called halaqa, which is kind of like Bible study. Um, and so we would sit in a circle and we would read Quran together and then we would tell stories together. And I got a lot of my knowledge from that too because not only were we sharing were we sharing stories from each other but we were getting that information in and we were researching it um on our own time so a lot of times we would be talking about gossip we would be talking about um you know the different prophets wives because that's pertaining to us because we're women the prophets wives were women yeah you know they were um they were so close to him and so we would learn from them who, who's your favorite? I don't know enough um, to say who's my favorite. <laughs> Actually, when I was younger, my friend and I, she found, like, I don't know if you know her. She found a, um, her name is Hidaya. She found our book report from when we were really young. Because there was a summer where we um, learned all of Surat al-Baqarah. So... We they told us to do this book report and it was I think on one of the prophet's wives. I don't remember anything. I literally don't remember mm-hmm. half of what I wrote in there, but I did it. I guess. I think 
So, so his wife Aisha, I legitimately think is one of the most interesting women in human history. Yeah, she's such a fascinating character mm-hmm. in, in his life and and off and after the. So she ba- So there's a time when the, the, there's a time because she actually went to war with Ali. I don't know a lot about that. Briefly, so I don't like to comment. On no, it's, <laughs> no, it's fine. But the the the. But there's also she started a, she kind of started a mini revolt against Uthman as well. She's just she's just an interesting character. Mm-hmm. That I, I she's fascinating, but that's that's a tangent. The so obviously you've kind of got these you've got this amazing. It's kind of a two edged sword, right? Because you've got these amazing examples that are well, inspirational in a lot of ways. But also, it's a lot to live up to as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is a lot to live up to, but I try not to overwhelm myself. Just because one, on the one hand, that was a com- that was fourteen hundred years ago, so it's a completely different world. But as far as values and morals, I try to adapt those to this life because this time, because that's what religion is: is it's constantly adapting to the time frame that it's in because obviously there's nothing in the Quran about planes right because that wasn't a thing um but there is something about travel um there's nothing in the Quran about I don't know I don't that's the first thing that came to mind but like a lot of the things you just have to adapt to but when it comes to like being empathetic and all of those things those are things that you don't necessarily have to adapt and they're a lot easier to follow so I just follow what I can and what I understand best um again i'm not extremely knowledgeable and that's just because of where i grew up and the people that i learned from you know a lot of my family is not religious it was very like here are some people on the side of the spectrum and here are some people over here and most people were on the not religious side of the spectrum so i didn't really have a lot of um it's not that i didn't have a lot of encouragement growing up doing that but to be religious but I didn't have a lot of examples besides my dad and my mom for the most part because my dad's pretty religious. Yeah. But everyone else is really not. So. I think my my encouragement to you would be that from from my at least from my worldview perspective, that, that while this all this may feel like a, a long way away, if it can feel like this endless mountain to climb and where do i even start Mm -hmm. i would say that you are made in god's image Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you literally look like what god looks like but that you are created by him in a way that you can actually understand your creator Mm -hmm. you're capable of understanding how the world works you're capable of knowing him and that you don't have to be afraid to, to to learn what what god is like because he's Ultimately, the Bible calls him a father, mm-hmm. and and the way the Bible defines what fatherhood is is not somebody with a long list of rules waiting for you to just kind of go wrong or get or get everything right so you can talk to him. Mm-hmm. There's this there's this story that is supposed to describe what God the Father is like. It's a story Jesus tells. Mm-hmm. There's a son. There's two sons, and one son says, "Father, give my me my inheritance now." And his father lets him have the money. Mm-hmm. And he goes to a different country, wastes all his money on food and drink and prostitutes and everything. Yeah. And he's... Every biblical and Islamic story has some sort of prostitute. Oh, yeah. <laughs> For some odd reason. It's the world's second oldest profession next to farming. Oh, wow. The... the um, I guess so. The, so the, this son goes, goes to all the... He goes to this country, wastes all his money, and then he's destitute because there's a famine. Mm -hmm. And he goes and works for this farm and ends up feeding the pigs. And he just, like, looks at the pig's food and just wishes he could have some of it. Mm -hmm. And suddenly he says he comes to his senses and realizes that my father's servants live better than I do. Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home and I'm going to say... Father, I'm not worthy to be called 
your son. Let me be one of your servants. Mm -hmm. So he goes home. And the father is waiting at the top of the hill, looking out for his son to come back. And he and he gets and he gets and his father just runs. This all runs and grabs his son and, and the son starts speaking, Father, I'm not worthy. And the father doesn't even let him finish. He says, Get the best robes. Slaughter the fattened calf. We're having a feast because my son who was dead is now alive. And the reason he tells this story is because that's the attitude God has. He's not waiting for us to fulfill all these rules and conditions. He wants relationship with us. That there is a problem. We have, we do sin. We, we are full of corruption and things that distance us from God. But that God himself wants to be close to us. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your souls. Because that, that's what God wants for you. He doesn't want you to feel like you have to do everything to be right with him. He wants you to feel like you can just kind of come, have a hug, be free from all the things that weigh you down so that he can put you to work in the world. And that's what I believe is the basis of the beginning of how the world gets better, how we get justice, mm -hmm. is if we have right relation with God, then we can start to have progress in making right relation with others as well. Yeah, because we have that example and we're doing stuff that we would want to happen to us too. We would want people to treat us with that same empathy and that same unconditionalness. I don't know if that's a word, but the whole idea of people just loving each other and wanting the best for each other despite whatever wrongs that they did in the past. Um, again, that's what I like to live my life by because people have done stuff and it's in their past people have maybe are still doing stuff but that's because they don't know what to do besides that um and a lot it's hard for people to live that way it's hard for people to live up to that to that example because they don't know how to and they don't want to yeah you don't know how to you don't know, want to and then and then if you but then if you're so weighed down by what's going on you you just don't even have the capacity to help others mm -hmm. right if you're just Oh, in your own head all the time you can't even deal with your own self for the day let alone 10 other, other people. people so it's, it's, it's got to start with God's love for you mm -hmm. and if you know that then you can have more you can have immense capacity for loving others mm -hmm. but if no one's taking care of you it's very difficult to do that oh yeah it is very difficult to do that I mean I'm struggling with that myself I extend my hand out all the time for people and it's really hard for me to um give myself that same love and that same um passion that i give to everyone else it's frustrating but it's it's a journey i'll get to it eventually <laughs> that's what therapy's for it's fine <laughs> but yeah the uh, the have you, what's what's your experience with is is therapy something that's pretty normal in the sort of Arab American community or no. is that no it's not um, so personally what I wanted to do originally with my life is I wanted to become a child psychologist and I wanted to do therapy with Arab American kids um, I changed my track a little bit um, I decided I'm gonna not go my master's I'm gonna go get my PhD mm -hmm. in community psychology and what I wanted to do is I wanted to focus on parenting programs with first and second generation Arab American parents, um, teaching them how to incorporate their culture into American culture. And um, I wanna base it on this, um, this theory of um, acculturation. I don't know if you know about it, but there's four ways to acculturate. Um, you either assimilate where you ignore your old culture and you take in your new one. Um, uh, you integrate, which is you take both. You separate, which you take your new one and you forget, or you take your old one and you forget the new one. And then you marginalize, which is very rare. You don't take either culture. You kind of just live in a subculture of nothing, which is basically impossible. Um, and so for me, the research project that I did was based on gender norms. And so I hypothesized that Arab American girls are more likely to separate because their parents have a lot of restrictions on them and don't that makes it hard for them to engage in American culture. And then I said that Arab boys integrate because they have the freedom to do whatever they want. Um, 
So my goal is that I want everyone to integrate. And so when you can integrate your bicultural and you're able to navigate both cultures more easily and more swiftly. And that was my basis for switching because for switching my idea of for switching what I wanted to do. Um, not because Arabs don't like therapy because I don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and they a lot of the times they don't believe in mental health, but because I'd rather uh, prevent something than deal with it after it's happened. Um, but therapy and I feel like a lot of the things that I've lived with or a lot of things that I'm dealing with now are a are a result of the way that I was raised and feeling so limited and feeling like I have to do everything for everyone else except for myself. Um, and people are like, well, just, you know, go out, take a walk. I'm like, taking a walk is not going to help me recognize my worth. Like, it's really not. Like, I can take a walk and give time to myself, but what it, it what really matters is what I'm thinking during that walk. Like, I can, anyone can take a walk. But it's really what you do during that walk that matters. And so that's what I'm doing therapy for is recognizing what I need to do to center myself because I don't know how to. And my and it's not even I think therapy has less of a bad rep than medications. (laughs) For sure. Like I'm on meds. I won't lie about it. I'll tell anyone I'm on meds. But my mom does not like people to know that. But I'm saying it in a podcast. Yeah. But I like I don't care because those are the things that are helping me at this moment in time. And I maybe not I might not take it forever, but it's just something that I need. And a lot of the times people will be like, well, just go pray or go read the Quran or whatever, something religious. I'm like, that's not going to help me. It might center me. It will definitely center me. And but it won't do anything if you do it once. You have to keep it, make it a routine. And that's something that they also don't recognize is it has to be a routine. Every, you have to make a routine for yourself to become better. And, and I'm, I'm really glad you're talking about this publicly because I know so many people who are struggling with the same thing. Mm-hmm. I don't think I know an Arab American woman who is not struggling with everything you're talking about. Mm-hmm. It's, it's endemic. And I actually read your paper, by the way. It was really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm glad you're talking about it on air. But I think those solutions, they they're basically taking a very simplistic idea of what a what a human being is. That it's not necessarily. I'm not saying that every every Muslim culture for all history has always done this, but you have this idea about what a person is that you have. You have basically a person is either is born neutral Mm -hmm. and if you have enough good influences you'll be a good person and if you have too many bad influences you'll be a bad person so the solution is if you're feeling bad then just get rid of all the bad and put in more good and then everything will be be great Mm -hmm. but the from my worldview i jesus says that evil comes from within our own hearts that we're both image bearers of god giving us dignity value and worth and we're all sinners intrinsically it's not based on external influence and i i really think that our problems are kind of innate to us Mm -hmm. and the what that leads to if we're just told these are just external things that we lead to we live this life where we look at everybody else and think they're doing great and then oh gosh what is uniquely wrong with me that's not wrong with everybody else why am I broken the way that no one else is broken? Mm-hmm. And that leads to no one ever talking about it. Hmm. I think for me, I don't believe that there's like an intrinsically like, I don't believe that I'm born wanting to sin. I think it's a taught thing. I think everyone is taught the same way when it comes to media and things like that. But when it, I think my whole idea isn't to exit out like with the isn't to what's the word my whole idea isn't that oh like the way that you were raised x's out the way that you're gonna feel about yourself and whatever i think it's more like teaching you to what's the word (laughs) teaching you to be resilient i think that's the most important thing about it is like i think everyone sins 
And I think that's because of the influence around us. Because Islamically, I think you're born you're born pure. Like just that's just an Islamic belief. But I think there's so many factors into people sinning that definitely me doing whatever I'm gonna do is not gonna change it, but it's definitely going to affect it. I don't know how to say it, but interdisciplinarianism that's kind of again going back to that like i'm gonna do this one thing and it's gonna affect some other things but other things need to happen in order for this kid to be good for life because i can help this child become resilient i can help teach these parents to teach that child to be resilient but at the end of the day there's still going to be laws set in place and there's still going to be systems of power that are go completely against that child's identity you know and that's kind of this that's kind of like the whole idea when you have like um single moms doing um like group therapy you know the world is still against them no it's not like no one like supports single moms but being a single mom is not is something that's frowned upon for the most part um but when they go to group therapy they're empowered and they're um they're able to do more things for their kid their kids and themselves so but yeah yeah I, I think and i wouldn't while i do believe sin is intrinsic i don't believe there's no external battle as well mm -hmm. i think that i, I think that primar like so for me i with my kids i do not need to teach them to bite each other <laughs> they didn't learn that from either of us definitely not but it, it's kind of in there. now so it, it's for, for me it's not an either or so ultimately, I, I believe everyone is responsible for dealing with their own problems. Mm -hmm. So I do not believe poverty makes somebody a criminal, for example. It doesn't help either. Mm -hmm. That I think we should be merciful to people who are poor. Mm -hmm. We should try and raise people's station in life. Mm -hmm. Yet that doesn't... Yet the, the, the problem is deeper than circumstances. Mm -hmm that giving somebody who's suffering or doing something bad money and comfort won't make them inherently better. I think those problems are still there. And I, I think you, you have this, my, my concern about the moment we live in right now is that we talk, we, we, I think we can idealize victimhood sometimes and so we have we live this we live in this world where it's people who who are oppressed are the good guys and people who have power are the bad guys and typically what that leads to as it does throughout human history is people use the sense that they're oppressed to justify pretty much anything they do to protect themselves a lot of the times yeah so if you look at say nazi germany legitimately they got a really Germany got a very bad deal in the Treaty of Versailles. Mm -hmm. the, the French wanted way too much from them. They made it unlivable for the people in okay. Germany. And they were victims in that situation. And when you're a victim, whether it's in interpersonal relationships or whether it's in politics, you start to think, okay, I've been wronged here. Things need to be righted. And whatever I have to do to make things right is justified. So show me a great empire in history that's oppressed people and destroyed people and trampled on people that hasn't first seen itself as the as the victim. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it... So there's got to be a stopping point. That's why I think it's important to have an objective idea of what justice is and strive really hard to hold to it. Otherwise, you just, you just turn into exactly what you tried to stop at one point. Mm -hmm. Do you think... Are you saying that you need a... You need a sense of uh, an objective sense of justice as you as a person, or you mean as like a culture and as a society? I think both. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, right, if somebody say 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 has stolen something from me, mm -hmm. I might want to kill that person. Mm -hmm. I might, that that really messed with me. That broke my life, and there has to be there has to be limits to that. So, in the Bible, 
the limit to theft would be the person has to repay what they've stole four times. And if they can't repay it, they have to work for you until they've paid it off. Mm -hmm. You can't then go kill that person. Mm -hmm. There's a limited sense in which justice has to happen. Mm -hmm. So so that's, that's on a personal level, right? Somebody's done something bad to me. There can be interpersonal justice or there can be forgiveness. I can choose to let something go. But justice has limits of how far it can can go. Right. So let's take a let's take a a culture. Let's just stick with Germany. Now, they there may there may have been a case that France took our land, and we can take it back. Mm-hmm. But then they went and invaded France itself, mm-hmm. right? And took that, and then they start saying, well, start to come up with conspiracy theories. Well, these Jewish, Jew, German Jews are not real Germans and they've taken all of our stuff and we're going to take their stuff too. And more. And more. And everything we can. Mm-hmm. So there's a certain point where if they needed an objective sense of justice but they could say, okay, this is how we've been wronged. And if they'd stepped in line with that, then there could have been peace on that justice. Mm-hmm. But because they just took that feeling of being wronged and had and just carried that out indefinitely. So in the same way, let's say you have let's say somebody uh murders somebody in your in your family. Mm-hmm. Now, the the limits of the law would be that that person can die. The person who murdered the person in your family can die. But through revenge, you could go kill that person and their whole family as well. And that is not just. That's not good. And that's transgressing the limits of the law because you're just basing it on how you feel wrong. It's like, because nothing can fill that hole of what they've stolen from you. Mm-hmm. So you just, if, if you're trying to appease your own feelings on what feels like justice, there's no stopping point. Mm-hmm. It just keeps going and going and going until it destroys everything. Mm-hmm. But if there's an, so there needs to be an objective stopping point to say, here and no further. Everything beyond this is out of man's hand and has to be in God's hand now. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it, it, it never ends. And that's yeah. why that's where it has to stop. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. That's, I think that's more of a, um, oh, there's a cat. Um, I understand that being more of like a limit and that's kind of what you mean by objective sense of justice because I was a little bit confused at first because I don't think that we'll ever hit an objective sense of justice just because everyone has a different idea of what justice is. And so it would be interesting to see how we would even get to that point because we're already at such a scattered point right now. Yes. Yeah, because there are so many people on different sides of the spectrum. Um, And there are so many people from different walks of life. There are people who, um, you know, are different from different races. They have different illnesses. They have different... Um, you know, economical backgrounds, financial backgrounds. Um, so it'd be hard to, that's what I, I was a little confused when you said objective sense of justice, but I get what you mean by like a limit because there definitely should always be a limit. And I think everyone should agree on that. Um, Islamically, there are ways to deal with murder and to deal with theft too, even to deal with um, adultery and stuff like that. Um, that's where Americans get Sharia law from but essentially sharia law is basically the whole religion in itself right and it's hard to define because mm-hmm. the 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 way they talk about it is they'll ask a muslim do you believe in sharia law and they'll be like yeah they'll be like, oh, i got you but it, mm-hmm. asking a muslim if they believe in sharia law is like asking an american if they believe in liberty yeah everyone's going to say yes mm-hmm. but they're going to mean different things by it you know ask somebody if they believe in justice who doesn't believe in justice mm-hmm. but everyone defines it differently the same mm-hmm. true with sharia mm-hmm. Yeah, that's like literally asking a Muslim, are you a Muslim? Yeah. It's like, what, what am I supposed to do with that question? And that's kind of what sucks, again, that comes back from fear, like that that idea that, you know, you're, you're afraid and it's because you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And so if people knew what Sharia law was, they wouldn't be asking dumb questions like that. And there's always dumb questions. Well, yeah, yeah. But even, even then, there is a, there, what they're scared of, is a very specific iteration of Sharia law. Yeah, and that's understandable. We're scared of it too. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. That, and that, that's where it gets. That's where it gets. That's where it gets messed up because of the, 
okay, they're, they're coming here to try and infiltrate America and turn yeah. it into this oppressive system. It's like, no, people are trying to get away from that system. There are people living in that system and they don't want to live in that system. Right. You know, there are people like hiding their own identities in that system. Why would they come here and try to make it that system? It's like the same people who are running away are the ones who are being treated like they are trying to bring it. Right. Over. But they're the ones that are trying to run away from it. And that's again uneducated americans like it's it's ridiculous like the education system in this country is so broken and it's it's so it's so wild to me how some people just don't understand basic concepts yeah that's why we're homeschooling yeah i didn't know that that's pretty dope yeah we so there's there's a couple of different co-ops we're a part of Mm -hmm. but the the idea is that it we with the system we use something called the trivium which mm-hmm. is this ancient Greek sort of medieval learning system, mm-hmm. which basically breaks down a child's development into three stages. Mm-hmm. The the grammar stage, which is learning facts. So when they're little kids, they're good for observing uh, absorbing dates and facts and what happened in history. Then the logic stage is figuring out how everything fits together and how to argue stuff properly. The middle school is are argumentative so teach with the grain teach them how to argue properly with proper logical constructs and middle schoolers yeah it's a fun age yeah and then high schoolers it's the rhetoric stage meaning that they're now getting ready to present their ideas to the world and what the u.s public school system does is that it teaches them it basically blends all those together so what it's encouraging so an elementary school kid is supposed to be able to present and make an argument on something he's learned two facts about Mm -hmm. and well maybe that would breed a culture of people who make arguments before they've properly absorbed information Mm -hmm. which is kind of what we live in Mm -hmm. and i think this 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 kind of comes to the 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 center of it is is trying to when we're not going to get to a good place on justice Mm -hmm unless we're prepared to educate ourselves to really understand what justice is and and get a and get an idea on it mm-hmm. if we because right now nobody bothers to take the time to figure out what's actually happening what they actually think they just find people to regurgitate that's like all these alt-right websites but also like cnn and you know a lot of democrats liberals do this they just follow you know like trevor noah for example like a lot of people just follow trevor noah and whatever he says it's funny and it sounds like it makes sense so i'm going to agree with it you know which is fine trevor noah is pretty cool he's smart he's all these things but you also need to look at it from your own perspective where are your own values and morals like even if even if what he says sounds good, maybe there's something that you actually don't agree with and you're afraid to say that you don't agree with it or you just don't have, um, you don't have the, what's the word? Yeah, sir. Does this mean you want me to hug you? What is it? Oh, okay. Okay. Hi. Hi. Well, okay. I understand. I guess I don't understand. Is he, he or she? It's a she. Is she really that likable? Yeah. It, for me? Yeah, it, it, it likes people. Yeah, the, it <laughs> it likes oh, people. It, I just call it cat number one. You don't have a name? It has a name. I call it cat number one. Does that mean you don't like her? No, it doesn't mean that. It means we have a... Oh, cat number two as well. <laughs> well, I think this is... <laughs> I think is this the end of our <laughs> interview? This, 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 is, this is us getting... This, this is us getting played out for now. The cat okay. is playing us out. Um, but we should do, we should do this again sometime. It's been fun. Yeah, it has been fun. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you for the conversation, and thank you guys for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Almeida Initiative podcast. <laughs> <laughs>